Hi, my name is Philip Cross, and I'm a 2016 Achievement Scholar. I studied international law at the University College London, and I'm an attorney with 10 years' experience in the environmental sector. At the 21st Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP21, the international community adopted the Paris Agreement and resolved to limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The 1.5 degrees Celsius target was hard fought by small island developing states like Jamaica as part of the alliance of small island states in the negotiations of the agreement. For us, exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius target presented an existential threat and demanded greater ambition from developed countries who had already benefited from their exploitation of the environment. The importance of the 1.5 degrees Celsius target was also confirmed in 2018 with a special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. Sadly, the United Nations Environmental Program Emissions Gap Report in 2020 revealed that existing commitments remain seriously inadequate and put the planet on course for a trajectory of warming of 3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Then, in August this year, the IPCC warned that the 1.5 degrees Celsius target will be beyond reach without immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in emissions in a report that has been described as Code Red for Humanity by the Secretary General of the United Nations. Several nations, including Jamaica, have now submitted new or updated climate pledges and will meet again at COP26, set for October in Glasgow. The Conference of the Parties, or COP, is where important decisions of an international agreement like the Paris Agreement are made, and a lot can be achieved there. However, given the lack of progress so far, one may wonder why a document which relies almost entirely on mandatory reduction targets can be expected to avert catastrophe. This presentation will focus on why the gentle approach of the Paris Agreement may still represent the best approach to resolving the climate crisis at this critical juncture. It will focus on some key aspects of the agreement, and I hope that by the end of it, you will have a good understanding of the role the Paris Agreement plays in fighting climate change, and the importance of ambition, transparency, and international cooperation in achieving these goals. So a brief disclaimer before I go on. The views that I express in this presentation, they're my personal views, and they don't necessarily reflect the views of any other entity. And moving on. What is the Paris Agreement? Well, the Paris Agreement does not force states to reduce the emissions by a set amount in order to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Rather, each state is allowed to determine what its level of ambition will be based on its own national circumstances and communicated in the form of a nationally determined contribution, or NDC for short, to the Secretariat. While an implementation and compliance mechanism is established under Article 15, it is defined as being facilitative, non-punitive, and non-adversarial. So this gentle approach has led many to wonder whether par the Paris Agreement is, an effective, um, is, is effective at all, and whether it is in fact a legally binding document. However, it is um, a legally binding document or treaty, as defined by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and is legally binding. Although it leaves some matters to be determined by states, other matters are mandatory, such as the requirement to submit successive, ambitious NDCs. The agreement states that parties shall prepare, communicate, and maintain successive NDCs, and shall pursue domestic measures to achieve them. Each new NDC must be more ambitious than the previous one, and must reflect each state's highest possible ambition. Importantly, states are required to submit the necessary information to allow parties and experts to scrutinize their NDCs. Um, and it must, they must be informed by the global stock take, which is a mechanism that periodically review, reviews sorry, uh, progress on achieving the climate objectives. This means that the NDC submitted by states cannot represent empty promises. Jamaica updated its NDC in 2020 to conform to new guidelines that were developed on clarity, transparency, and, under and understanding agreed to at COP24 in Katowice in, in Poland. The NDC of Jamaica now incorporates the issue of land use, change, and forestry into its commitment. Now, forests are important um, as they 
help biodiversity, and they're also a natural means of containing centuries worth of carbon dioxide, as recognized by Article, f Article 5 sorry, of the Paris Agreement on what are referred to as carbon sinks. Conserving ecologically important forests like the Cockpit Country and the Blue and John Crow Mountains in Jamaica therefore plays, can play an important role in the overall objective of the agreement. Jamaica also agreed to reduce its emissions from the energy sector, both in terms of production and in terms of consumption, within its NDC. However, as a developing country, it is recognized that the ability of Jamaica to achieve these targets is dependent on the assistance that can be provided by the international community. And this is highlighted in the, agreement, it's in the Paris Agreement itself. So having considered briefly the nature of the Paris Agreement, um, it's important to return to the question of how big the problem really is. Um, I briefly mentioned this in my introduction. However, the first global stock take is actually set for 2023 and is still there for some distance off. So the 2020 UNEP GAP report that I mentioned provides a, a good early benchmark for the challenge ahead. The report of UNEP in 2020 sought to assess the difference between NDCs that had been submitted thus far by states and compare that to what would be required in order to achieve the 1.5 or even the 2 degrees Celsius objectives of the Paris Agreement. And it refers to this as the emissions gap. But a key finding of that report was that in order to, um, to achieve the 2 degrees Celsius target, the ambition of the NDCs so far submitted would have to be increased threefold, while the 1.5 degrees Celsius target would demand a five-fold increase of ambition. And as such, the planet is, was currently, at the time of that report, on a trajectory to at least three degrees Celsius of warming. And it also noted that even with the reductions in emission, emissions due to the pandemic, this benefit would only be short-lived if countries decided to pursue very aggressive economic recovery plans. Then, the contribution of Working Group 1 to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, because the IPCC releases periodic reports every few years, um, th so the sixth report came out in August, and this report created further panic in the, in the international community. It confirmed what climate scientists had been saying for decades, but now with even more certainty. And it demonstrated that a lot of the fears that had been communicated were now um, being realized and were irreversible for centuries or even millennia. It noted that anthropogenic or man-made global warming was unequivocally... Um, taking place, and it noted that with virtual certainty, the increase in extreme weather patterns that we've been seeing in terms of forest fires, flooding, um, hurricanes, and the increasing intensity of hurricanes, that this was virtually certainly due to man-made climate change. It, it said that the melting of the ice caps and the increase in sea level rise would be irreverse is irreversible for centuries to millennia, but it provided a small glimmer of hope by showing that the 1.5 degrees Celsius target that we had reached for is still within reach, provided that the deepest emissions scenario that they examined is actually followed through. So with such high stakes, the question is, why not force states to, meet, to reduce their ambition, emissions in order to reach the targets of the climate agreement? However, it has been said that the legal bindingness as a feature is not necessarily the silver bullet of international cooperation that many might believe it is. Binding obligations take longer to negotiate. Um, they reduce ambition as per parties are less willing to commit to things that they are to be legally tied to. And uh, it sets issues in stone despite changing landscapes. With climate change, we've seen over time how the issue and the seriousness of the issue has increased. <coughs> As such, there are much it, it is much less likely to foster the cooperation that is required for success. And this is precisely what occurred in the predecessor to the Paris Agreement, known as the Kyoto Protocol. This document was adopted in 1997, and possibly due to the issues mentioned before, it took seven years to enter into force. It set mandatory emissions targets for developed countries only, and imposed penalties for non-compliance. This approach may have limited the ambition as parties would have been um, unwilling to set targets that they would then subsequently not be able to achieve. And developing uh, country emitters such as China and India, who 
although they are developing countries, are major emitters, they had no binding obligations under the agreement. And so the United States review, viewed this as being an unfair state of affairs and refused to ratify the convention. And then Canada in 2011 realized that it wasn't going to be able to meet its emissions targets. And so rather than face the penalty that would come as a result of that, they decided to withdraw from the, from the Kyoto Protocol. Now in contrast, the Paris Agreement is strategically set up to encourage all parties to put forward their highest possible ambition. A repeat of these events today would almost certainly ensure that the 1.5 degrees Celsius target would not be met. So, what can be done? Well, it's important to highlight that although many of the provisions in the Paris Agreement are not legally binding, um, such as the, there is no requirement to meet emissions targets, that isn't to say that the agreement is without teeth. Rather, domestic mitigation, as opposed to international enforcement of commitments, is the key to success in, an, in a complex issue such as climate change. And as such, private persons have a role to play as they can motivate states to live up to their commitments. Also, while litigation is a tool of last resort, um, since the Paris Agreement, there has been a significant increase in what is referred to as climate litigation, which are basically um, legal cases where there is an issue of fact or law related to climate change mitigation, adaptation, or climate science. And the soft approach to the Paris Agreement facilitates norm creations, which then assist in pursuing traditional causes of action in areas such as administrative law, human rights, and tort. Two examples of this are worth noting. So in Urgenda Federation and the Netherlands, the court concluded that the emissions targets of the Netherlands were not ambitious enough, and it ordered the state to reduce its, ambition, its emissions sorry, by 25 to 40 percent compared to its 1990 levels. The court also held that the human rights obligations that the Netherlands had meant that it had a direct obligation to pursue and to act consistently with the goal of achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius target under the Paris Agreement. This decision was upheld by the Supreme Court in the Netherlands in 2019. Then, in Future Generations and Ministry of Environment in Colombia, the plaintiffs, which were a group of young persons representing diverse areas of Colombia, they argued that the government was not doing enough to, to achieve the commitments it, ha it had already made under the Paris Agreement to reduce deforestation to net zero by 2020 in the Colombian Amazon. The court agreed with them and held that the failure was a violation of the climate's human rights, as well as the rights of future generations of Colombians. And very strikingly, it declared that the Amazon was a subject of rights. So, at COP26 in Glasgow this year, parties will now seek to settle implementation rules under the Paris rulebook relating to transparency, which is under Article 13, and carbon markets under Article 6. Other issues will also be high on the agenda, which are very important to developing states like Jamaica, including clarifying what is meant by the global goal on adaptation in the Paris Agreement and delivering on a 100 billion per annum, 100 billion US dollars per year um, climate finance commitment that had been made by developed countries in 2009 in Copenhagen. However, ultimately, the meeting will represent another opportunity to increase ambition and to realign global efforts to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So considering the two cases, our agenda in the Netherlands and future generations in Colombia, we can see that even though the Paris Agreement doesn't set binding mitigation targets, it nevertheless creates enough of a foundation to allow private citizens to take legal action to ensure that one, states take the necessary action to pursue their climate um, mitigation targets that they've set for themselves, and two, that they set mitigation targets that are ambitious and that represent the highest possible ambition. And therefore, the Paris Agreement in this way is able to stimulate more ambition from states than its predecessor, the Kyoto Protocol, which instead causes states to be less ambitious to avoid legal action. So, with this in mind, at COP26 in Glasgow later this year, parties will seek to implement further rules to clarify them under the Paris rulebook relating to transparency under Article 13 and carbon markets under Article 6. 
Other issues will also be discussed, which will be very important to developing states like Jamaica, including clarifying what the meaning is of the global goal on adaptation and delivering on the $100 billion per year promise that was set in 2009 in Copenhagen. Ultimately, however, the meeting in 20, uh, COP26 in Glasgow this year will represent another opportunity for states to increase their ambition and to realign their goals to achieving the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming target set for, by the Paris Agreement. Thank you.